Thank you very much to attending for attending this panel. It will be very difficult for me, I can promise you that. And I'm not joking because there's lots of questions here, lots of congratulations, interests, emotions that we need to bring out in a format which is more similar to an anatomy lesson. But anyway, I don't know whether this is the most appropriate place for that, or the least. When we invited Ramon, Ramon was concerned. You were concerned. Yes, was I? Yes, you were, I can promise you, I can assure. I can assure you, you were. Because of art. Because of the art part. And I remember we had a coffee, we spoke on the phone. I remember now what it was. I think it was on the phone, Salamanca. This link that we have, Barcelona Salamanca, is also always very useful. And I told you, well, art. Since the 60s, but especially since the 90s, has become interested in things that you talk about. You have talked about the archive as depository of the new memoir or new memory and if, if we go to the main contemporary art museums we will find the creation of archives of new memory. In it, anyway, everything that you mention we can find in contemporary artists whether we like them more or less. So, for your peace of mind what you've told us falls within what we were looking for. So the archive in itself tells things that art takes, transforms and translates. I was very interested in asking you to the side of this comment on the prefiguration of the archive. So to what extent does the archive prefigures or forms the reality or the future, the knowledge, and does a sort of a previous construction of a reality for the future. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me all right? My contribution will be very short because I told Jordi I felt uh, I didn't feel too good because I had 45 minutes and then others uh, only did I had 20 I will did only one contribution I will only make one because they have better things to say than I do so anyway it is true that when Jorge called me and Silvia to do this I told them well this is a great honor for me but I don't I know nothing about art. Well, there's some things I do know, but I don't want to talk about things I don't know about. I'm sorry for the translators because of all this mess I've done with my words, but anyway. The experience and what you've lived, everything. So anyway, I use an expression a lot, which is the role of prefiguration we have in the archival science people, some people think this is very relevant and we have two ways of thing, saying this. The first one is that some people constraint this. So you just organize and that people will use everything and don't bother too much. So just apply the methodology as a magic recipe and then people will just, you know, be about their own stuff. And the other one is saying, well, no, I am an archivist who is an activist as well, so I want to focus on my work in a way that I am open to many different manifestations in order to show the documentary aspect as much, but so that other people can construct magnificent structures or extraordinary books, as Philippe was doing before with Dossier Bertrand. This is an archive. I, I thought that was very interesting. So I'm going to buy the archive and I research, do some research on that archive. And that is very interesting. And I've also been very concerned about being open 
in thinking that what we do is not innocent, no matter how much methodology and science that we place, it's not a precise or exact art. So how can we call something insignificant? So that bill or that invoice that subsequently has an extraordinary value or can prove many things. And I've always been very concerned about this. This is why amplifying the concept and the materials has been very interesting to me. And I'm becoming more and more critical regarding the restrictive definition of archives when they tell you this has not produced as an organic production of lord knows what but the archive of a community even if it's unorthodox is also important or the social archive you know in the network there's a lot of trash right but there are many interesting things also then of course you need to give it a relevant approach it's about mm, well you know you need to base your work on ethical and methodological principles in order to better understand today's society and supply information to a more and more heterogeneous and horizontal audience. This makes sense only if we have an active role and not a role which is, let's say, obsessed with methodology. When I meet with people from Girona, the Catalan government, the academia, etc., they tell me, oh, you're very lucky with politicians because you have to deal with nice politicians. No, no, no. But I know who they are. I know who they are. Now I can say that because I'm retired. And I know what they are interested in. And, you know, if you deal with an IT expert, you need to take one approach. Whereas if the other one is a lawyer, you need to take another approach. So it's very important to be able to adapt and, you know, take a relevant approach a coherent approach and I believe this to be an extremely important element for example the pre-configuration ones I dealt with a politician who is very important today I'm not gonna say who and he was very much IT oriented and at the beginning we had a difficult relationship we overcame our differences because he's an educated and cultivated man and so am I or at least that's what I want to think. He thought I hated technology, and I told him that he had an eye-critical and naive definition of technology. And, you know, he was very much obsessed with technology back then in the 90s, when technology was not so much developed. And once he said to me, administrative archives are important. And I was like, well, yeah, but they predefine the historical archives of the future. And the documents we gather today and the story today will predefine the historical archives of the future. There's a character whom I love, and he has been criticized. Since 1949, 1959, he gathered all documents available from all different professionals in Barcelona. He had millions of pictures, more or less well documented, knives, documents, images. For him, everything was to be archived. He had an historian approach and he was very critical. Of course, methodologically speaking, he was weak, but he had a terrific vision. And let me close by quoting someone I really enjoy and I, or I really like, President Maragall, who once told me something that made me understand how precise things can be. I am from Girona, I can't like, oh, I trust you, but I give you one command, don't touch the city's like, oh, I trust you, but I give you one command, don't touch the city's historical archive, it's sacred. He told me, it's the ID of the city. When you want to access them as opportunity to comment on the images that you have. If you believe this to be timely now, feel free to comment on the images that you had no time to comment before. But you know, when it comes to the question how to reactivate archives or how to build up archives based on vernacular elements, my, I, I've taken some notes and one of the notes was 
taking archives out of walls and hanging them, bringing archives into books. And you've shown a very interesting book that you have published with a performative nature, as, the, as it is said today, a quite a strong performative element. The element that you mentioned before by George Pompidou takes archival codes and brings them up to the wall. So my question would be, what is the answer to... I mean, how can we decode archives? How can we bring archives down from the walls and bring them into vernacular influence environments and not exhibition codes? I hope the question was clear. Um, merci, Georgie. <laughs> uh, alors, je... Euh, j'ai passé des, des slides rapidement, mais euh, parce que as, 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 as desires tend to be, it's just not an option. And one of the hypotheses that contemporary art promotes, and I was thinking about Thomas Erchon with Thomas and Daniel Defer, the founder of Michel Foucault and the founder of the AID Association, the first organization to fight AIDS in France. So with, uh, in the context of the anniversary, we worked with Thomas Duchamp in a 24 hours performance. Uh, not necessarily a monument, it was entitled 24 hours with Foucault and actually what really struck me was that Thomas has promoted an exhibition about archives without archives. In other words, he opened a museum with a bookshop with Michel Foucault and in the windows rather than archives, rather than photocopies of archives he just stamped paper and Michel Foucault was depicted as a teacher in Collège de France and the picture was empty and during these 24 hours the people shape the Foucault archive, the archive which could have been very patrimonial oriented, that night, well, was reshaped. And this really inspired me for the um, reshaping of the Pompidou Center rather than the Pompidou Center is not a museum, it's not a restaurant, it's not a library, it's not a cinema theater, nor a theater room. It's all of the previews at the same time. When you step into the Pompidou Center, you change your shoes and you feel like at home. So how are we going to archive all this? And you know where Thomas' work becomes very interesting? Well, precisely because at the beginning, archive professionals must, to be, must be present. You don't see archives, you donate them. We transfer them, we offer them. And then, you know, Thomas, in all his work, he's there, he's present. From the beginning to the end, from the first to the last hour, he's there, he's big, he's a big guy. And he hosts people. 
He welcomes people. No as an authority, but rather welcoming people at home. Another interesting element is that what interests me in Duchamp is the process. The archiving gesture at the Pompidou Center, what I have archived is the archives of the of archiving so all the this positive like the magnetophone the forms the stamps the labels <laughs> when in fact back then the president of the Pompidou Center was reluctant towards the project they were like, no, we're only 40 years old, we don't want an archive, archive means death, etc. So, when we celebrated our 40th anniversary and the minister came, they were like, yeah, 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 tell the minister a little story, you know? So, it's this tension with, between life and death, which for me is central. And this is what I wanted to show, because through other elements also, right? The fa I'm thinking about another artist with whom I've had the chance to work and which actually and Kino Segal Kino Segal, I mean there's nothing there he does his work, he spends hours and hours speaking but no one has a right to take pictures or to record the session. We don't even have a name, um, nor a contract, because when there's a contract, it means we are somehow co-authors, isn't it? So we just send each other money. And this is very much interesting to me. Now, what is archiving today? It's a social and a political statement. Let me go back to terrorist attacks. We have experienced terrorist attacks in Paris and I'm convinced that very, very few people will visit the millions and millions of documents in Paris archives which are there preserved and that speak about the notes that tourists would send to say I love Paris, etc. The same happened in New York, in Atocha and in Barcelona after the terrorist attacks in all the cities. But what really matters here is that archivists, amateur archivists at the beginning, but also normal people, well, they felt responsible and they would protect them from rain, from the rain then archivists arrived and it was very important for archivists to be there, to be present because if I compare this with the field of medicine I would say that they are public health agents so they, they are democratic health agents I don't want to take too much of your time because you know how French people are we're speaking about actors of the everyday life and this is possible thanks to such practices because this is exactly what we are experiencing with the organization for the for auto biographies that we created with Philippe Lejeune an expert in autobiographies we did set up an organization that still exists where people can hand over their personal diaries, letters, correspondence, etc. Obviously, personally, as an historian, I have worked on the basis of these materials, but it is also clear that gathering the documents becomes much more important than using 
the materials, but the only fact that this exists, the fact that we are recognized and that we can leave a footprint and that the footprint is going to be seen by others and respect this footprint and in the act of archiving this is essential and what really interests me is to see how artists participate in this welcoming and also how literature hosts or does not host or leaves room to memories and I believe that today we are managing to move forward down this line to respond to this need without being too authoritarian because it's not about asking or forcing everyone to open their boxes and take their archives away well, it could have been the case but thankfully it hasn't there's a certain popular ethnography that was produced this way experts would pop up in farms and somehow take away documents this was a very authoritarian archives policy how to redefine our relationship with power is an important element I could speak forever but I'm gonna leave it here I have heard the reader for hours and hours speaking, speaking about this and perhaps this makes us different from our Dutch friends but we've heard the reader and listened to the reader for many many hours if you allow me this is a personal desire of mine you said what personal archives underline is not its reliability but rather its extreme richness this is a quote of yours in a conference in Argentina could you elaborate on this quote because you are the most I've got a proof of that actually yeah you were in a conference in Argentina maybe it was an online conference what archives underline is not precisely its reliability the self saying the true like the theirs but its extreme richness to me this quote is related with Henry Box example to what extent is Henry Box telling the truth which becomes a show a spectacle and perhaps personal archives are mystified as being more genuine or reliable when in fact they are not more reliable than others only that perhaps they are richer I am not sure I have understood the entire question but I am going to answer with a very simple example and this is what you can see in the internet today after all the social struggles that have taken place in France the white in 2019 and 2021 this has to do with the yellow vests movement and an entire population that have never manifested themselves started wearing these yellow vests and then they were there's a group of activists who decided to set up a database where yellow vests could send a picture of their vests and today this is entitled my back is full of yellow vests dot com dot 
OR gym, and maybe this responds to a certain extent to your question, the archive could not exist without the internet. It would be just impossible. We could not even have access to the archive without the internet, and I believe this is the case. I mean, in the conference in Buenos Aires, Mm. was, I mean, the attendance was very high. When we speak about archives like yours, we can read everything all together. But when we speak about popular archive, we cannot read everything. And this has to do with the debate yesterday on technology and on the extraordinary uh, advantage of working online but this produces a certain illusion which is the illusion according to which all memories are equal and it's not true not all memories are equal this is a big lie and I would say that this is the main lie that democracy promotes not all memories are the same the memories of minorities are not like majorities memory not to speak about the difference between men's and women's memories the history of men and women cannot be written with the same sources. You cannot speak about Afro-descendants as if you were speaking about Europeans. And the internet cannot recover all these differences. I'm not sure this is the answer to your question, but hey, this is my answer. And at the same time, I believe this is one of the main illusions that uh, we archivists sometimes have. I believe we must acknowledge this. You cannot ask people to come with their archives and everything will be marvelous. No, no, no. There's a limited number of archives and such archives are, of course, uh, run by a patriarchal order, a capitalist order, etc. I will not go as far as Derge's narrative in his book, his approach to museums. I believe he would have the same opinion regarding archives. He would say that archives are by definition about domination. So you cannot write history based on archived information because there's a bias there or many different bias you the archivists in the room and many other stakeholders from this field while well, your presence here underlines the idea according to which archives are the archives of power in the in-betweens of power power also produces biases and such biases are present in our archives but I am not gonna monopolize the floor it's a complicated topic thank you it is important because uh, to go back to a previous slide, well, a slide that I didn't show, we had an exhibition in Marseille composed of drawings of psychiatric patients and we developed a potential archive of these drawings which was a colonization archive, a psychiatric archive I believe this is another way to
to allocate importance to things that were in the bin, to information that was thrown to the bin for not being net art. So from there on, from these drawings, we can redefine the world, and I believe this is beautiful. You have answered the question, partially, to a certain extent, but you've also added a lot to the speech and the discourse, so win-win for all. I wanted to make the most of Perez Jaume's presence. I'm not going to ask you about your text because text is text at the end of the day. And we're not going to comment on what you've read or written, but knowing of your work, I would like to know how you think about you could archive that work because, well, it's complex, especially having heard you reading today and speaking. It's a paradox because on the one hand, Nuria helps me archive the work and on the other hand, I there's an archiving task that I do on the one hand it seems like you must organize the work that you have and protect it to the extent that Um, works are now framed and they used to be always limited so the loss of that frame generates a difficult con a context that is difficult to read so there's the possibility of having an easier narrative reading all spaces are difficult to a certain extent and spaces can get very complicated. This allows to have a uh, syntax that is more linked to continuous works. So this on the one hand is the positive part of the archive. Then on the other hand, it is different as has been said today. If there is the artist doing it or not. So this is done by um, all his work. He can make certain decisions, and he is right in this sense. But very likely, in the face of a future spectator, a spectator, this could be um, something that prevents them from enjoying it because it's like the magician doing a hands game. They're interested in the effect that trick has on the audience. The trick, well, they are only concerned about the audience, aren't they? I always have problems with this. I don't know why. Thank you so much. Oh, wait. Don't draw. Oh. <coughs> so, the audience always wants to see the trick. So with the Bure and the Angla archive, well, I went to the to do the military service. They went to do the military service in Mallorca in the 50s, and there came a time when he was drawing in his workshop and he had a model. And there was a green and a red and a yellow one there and I thought that information for me was basic and trivial to understand it and he was interested in us knowing about all this as well so there's worlds in the archive world but there's another simultaneous world and 
It's all about keeping this on the outside. We are experiencing an urban and massified context with very wide and vast and complex cities. And in order to administer that such huge collective of humans and mammals, well, archives are essential for that. However, in a rural context with smaller communities, the relationship with the archive is much wiser. There's trust in life that preserves the culture and the legacy. We don't need to make it monumental. Things don't need to be gold or marble. They need to be spoken in the voice. And culture is the same. A culture with lots of uh, bronze weapons and universities and libraries and museums, keeping it alive with great muscle in order to maintain all that alive is not better. It's actually not necessary, and other cultures are as dignified as that one. It's much wiser because it does not generate waste. In the end, archival science is waste creating, and this brings on lots of conflicts and problems. What do we do with this waste? You were doing it saying it before anything can turn into a waste and we cannot be snowed under all these things. It's a fantasy to think that you can keep everything. Philippe, you were talking about bringing the archive on top. And in the rural world, there is the key figure, which is the noise. It's the end of the day. That's where things, that's a cycle of life basically, things being taken out of the land and put back into the land, so zero waste, and you're going through life in a lightweight fashion and it's as simple as that. But what happens is, well, how can we do this in a more global culture such as ours. How do we do this? How do we experience this essence that has reached the rural world at any rate? I believe the model is this one. The model is not to accumulate and have this huge and vast amount of craziness around us. Because as I was saying, works are alive because we make them alive. And documents are also alive, if we provide them with an entity, we have to respect that entity. If you provide an animistic state to a document, no, non-human thing, but you give them a life card, you are forced to deal with it, not just put it away and not look at it again. So this forces to have endless relationships and we are limited and we need to understand that happens. It's truly very complex. The idea of the world as a place that evocates culture is becoming increasingly clear. I have been preaching this for a long time and culture pollutes as any other thing pollutes and we need to take into account what we put into the world and these models I was talking about the rural models are, more, are very useful for me with this idea of regenerating materials that keep endlessly recycling people keep things in the rural world as well. But even barns in the rural world have an annual um, cleaning up. Well, if you will allow me, I want to clarify this. No, 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 no. In archival science, 
appraisal is very significant and it is a reduction of volumes basically because we know we cannot preserve everything. So what I'm saying is that having said this, the will of making an archive a mirror of the current society, we need to work along these lines. And for sure, whenever we apply appraisal systems that end up with full destruction, well, destroying 70% of what we're producing here in Barcelona, for instance, so 1,000 linear meters of um, documents, so that's a huge amount of boxes and 200 and something were burnt, for instance. But when we're in that process, we need to take into account that, yes, we reduce, but we need to find other materials that can complement the richness that go beyond the institution. And this is what I would like to stress. We need to take into account with the appraisal of documents without putting them in context and just thinking they're insignificant. As I was explaining before, the receipts of the Santa Fe police, for instance, that is a document that is um, an innocent document and we just do away with it and it is actually not. We have improved the archival science a lot in terms of methodology, but we have not fine-tuned on a topic that is paramount, which is criteria for appraisal in order to have representative samples so that those who come after us have a look at society and the necessary tools. Well, one thing uh, or a different world would be the rural world or culture. They have other things, of course. I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Yes, you're absolutely right. And I understand your argument here, but sometimes this capacity of keeping things is celebrated, and especially technology has helped in keeping a wide array of materials. And I was telling this in my text. The current world is very surprising, and people end up being trapped in the most basic things, so the amount of works that we have is, is just huge. But you see people looking at um, advertising and the most immediate things, and wherever there's shit, people just go to it like flies. And you have an endless catalog of possibilities, so why do we have all that? So much repertoire and heritage, when we just go to the little stupid things at the end of the day, this generates lots of questions we should ask ourselves about. I wanted to ask another question, Berejelma, a short one. You work with Nuria, so I believe that you know the world of archives. I think you do, yes. And anyway, it's related with the story you told about the uh, light of color lights and the model when an artist's face faces the fact of archiving his works, the description of those documents, should the appraisal be done by themselves as it happens that it is going to move to the future and the way it's interpreted should be the opinion of the artist himself is that the right way to go, or would that be a wrong way to go? I'll try to go back to the beginning. In our case with Nuria, what we try to do is to establish a narrative of the work. So for the time being, I'm not at all interested in the biograph biographical part of it all. But it is clear and obvious, as I was saying before, very likely people will be more interested in that. But that's what interests me the least. I'm organizing my work and artists have played hard because our profession has 
been very much diluted. I don't know what we do. We touch upon many different disciplines and not only that, but each work is made up by many disciplines. It can include photography, what has been done previously and later on, what your neighbor has done. There's nothing that remains isolated. So any gesture is very complex and the archive protects all this and helps in its explanation. Sometimes it's more simple with drawings because they're just that, drawings and paintings and material informing of all this. Nowadays when you prepare a piece, there's the text explaining the piece and then the piece also that needs to be preserved digitally speaking and uh, how it is exhibited and next to what <laughs> and it would be an endless story so we need to fix it a bit and to establish that this work is this and you can even direct the actual reading of it but let's describe it in a way in which you're already orienting the reader towards the description and that's all I wanted to say. Now that Nodia is here, on correspondence and everything, we haven't even touched that. Okay, so we are about to um, die of hunger. Should we ask you a question? Because you're somehow, well, I'm the boss. So anyway, I'll decide. Having seen the exhibition, I am much more interesting please don't be mad at me but the the reflection done on the exhibition than the actual result that does not mean it's a mistake it is just my personal um, battle against uh, sonography this is my opinion just to contribute anything or something at least to this panel but when are you going to find this Anglada Camarasa building his archive is it going to be something automatic will it be a discovery how is that research process is all the work done or will you have to somehow tie some things with others An interesting thing about exhibiting archives is that, well, it's difficult. It's not something easy. The works on their own, I think, Pere Jaume said this very clearly. The works, well, they hardly need any mediation, of course. Obviously, there could be mediation. The artist can mediate. But in the case of archives, when there's an exhibition of archives, they need more mediation because we need for those to look at the archive to be able to interpret it. We need that interpretation by the spectator. Eduard, who is curator of this exhibition and myself, we were concerned about this scenography. In fact, there were some proposals that were very scenographic, even more, which had nothing to do with the Anglada Camarasa archive, but I also have to say that the process of exhibiting the archive went through many stages. At first, we were talking about Anglada Camarasa, and Anglada Camarasa and work is just one. We could not only talk about Anglada Camarasa without talking about his work. And I remember with the Avanti designers and Alex Dobaños telling him, Hey, Alex, we don't want to talk about the works of Anglada. We want to put the archive in a museum and in an attractive fashion. And after having researched the archive in order to exhibit it, I mean, you need to have your own interpretation values, which are for sure not the same as those of the user. But I remember that the granddaughter said, I mean, you need to become uh, the adoptive child of Anglada Camarasa because you know more things than I do about him. Well, you can't exhibit on someone without knowing 
how that person thought or who he was, that the person that manages an archive or a work in this commercial way, well, was not too right. So the first process was to get to know Angela Camarasa, apart from his professional career, the most formal part of it all, of course. There was an Angela Camarasa that we discovered through the different texts and documents. And at least in my case, and I believe this was the case with Eduardo as well, there was a strong relationship between Anglada Camarasa and his work. And you can see that very feasibly in his documents. It is very difficult to study the archive without knowing about his work, because Anglada, it's him and his work. So the relationship there was very easy. I can very clearly remember the moment I opened that blue notebook. It was like being in Anglada Camarasa's house. You're certainly in the face of a weak man with his professional career, and he's concerned about remaining in the memory of men and humanity because he's very, the, the way he writes is very explicit. He didn't write too much, but what he did write was very clear. So we thought that this degree of intimacy the author was providing us with through his documents had to be communicated in the exhibition. There is a sort of a certain degree of stage design, and we wanted this to be the first exhibition that introduced an archive within a national museum, and that's why it had this staging. Well, you know that today we're going to have a guided visit. I have been looking at the time poster for a long time, so I would like to ask for your permission. Thank you very much for being here in the panel. Thanks to the participants who have made things very easy. And let's have lunch. Oh, okay.